Thank you, Miss Barb. Before we get going, I just want to mention we need to be in prayer for uh, Sri Lanka and the Christians there. Uh, the terrorist attack this morning. Uh, last I read, they're saying at least eight churches were targeted on Easter morning. Uh, Satan always tries to pull his nonsense, uh, but uh, our hope will not be thwarted. So we just lift up uh, the believers of Sri Lanka. We hope what Satan meant for evil, God will turn to good and it will spark a, re a revival in that nation and a rebellion against uh, the false religions of hate and murder and lies who perpetrate these things. So uh, we'll keep them in mind. Also remember, right now we're collecting our uh, Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American missions. 100% uh, of that offering goes to supporting our missionaries local and abroad on the back of your bulletin you'll see there. Uh, our goal, I, I can almost read that back door, not quite. It's 4,500, 4,700, somewhere in there. We're at 18 or 1900. It's more important than ever, uh, North American missions. I used to think it kind of sounded silly. If you're like me, you were born and raised in the church and you always thought of missionaries going overseas. But do you realize that now Asia is sending missionaries to America? We've become so godless and corrupt. They have no fear of God that, that Africa and African churches are sending missionaries to America. The American church has become weak and anemic and has lost the power and the hope of the gospel. And that's what we have to proclaim without fear and without compromise, as so many are willing to do. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do something really quick, if you would. If you have your Bibles, open them to Mark chapter 15. And uh, Mark chapter 15, we're going to look at the 22nd verse. And if you are able to, I just want to ask you to stand as we just read this part of the gospel. Mark chapter 15, verse 22, it reads, Then they brought Jesus to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with transgressors, that's Isaiah 53, 9. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way that he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Let us go to the Lord and ask his blessing upon the reading of his word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we think about the acts of terror that seems like the devil always tries to... Uh, perpetrate on this day, the Lord's day, when we celebrate our risen Savior. 
Year after year, it seems like this happens, and there's always fails. No scheme of hell can thwart your glorious plans, Lord God, and we are so grateful for it. Lord God, evil comes upon those who pursue righteousness, and yet you use all things for the good of those who love God and are called according to your purpose, Lord God. No one more so than Christ. No greater act of injustice has ever been perpetrated upon a man. Nobody so blameless and innocent, spotless and holy has ever been crucified among sinners, nor will it ever happen again. Lord God, we thank you that in the garden he cried out, Lord, he says, not my will but yours be done, and he submitted to the cup, the cup of your wrath. Lord God, we are so grateful, Lord God, that he was willing to bear the wrath that we all deserve for our sins. Lord God, we ask that you would be with the people of Sri Lanka. We ask that you would be with the true believers there, that they would not be discouraged. We know they are today. They might be frightened today, Lord God, but let the boldness of the gospel Lift them up. Let the presence of the Holy Spirit encourage them and strengthen them and give them an increased boldness. They may kill us, but they can't kill us. We have everlasting life through Jesus Christ. Lord God, we pray that your spirit of peace that surpasses all understanding would be upon all the victims of today's terrorist attack, Lord God. We pray that justice would be brought upon those who perpetrated such acts of evil, but we know with confidence, even if they are never caught and tried, prosecuted and punished here on earth, Lord God, vengeance is yours, and your vengeance is swift, and it is fierce, Lord God. Lord God, we love you, we praise you that we have been spared your vengeance through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we ask the blessing of the reading of your word. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. As we look on, after the immediate crucifixion of Christ, we talked at length about this on Friday, we see there were also some women looking on from a distance. Verse 40, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the Less and Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, up in the northern part of Israel, where the country folks, the farmers, the agrarian society lived, they used to follow him and minister to him, and there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem, these disciples, and they witnessed from a distance the crucifixion of Christ. A point I made it out, uh, I made on Friday was the disciples were scattered. They were walking from a distance, but nobody was really close enough to the cross to really hear these last sayings of Jesus from the cross. So how do they hear? I really think the answer lies there in that centurion in verse 39 who was standing right in front of him, who probably drove the nails into his hand and lifted the cross up high with Jesus' body hanging upon it. And he sat there and watched the way he died and the way he drew his last breath and said, truly this man was the Son of God. What a great proclamation of faith. In the gospel, I mean, talk about a murderer repenting on the spot. And I think a lot of what we have is from him. I think he probably became a believer in Jesus Christ and a member of the first century church. As we read on, the Sabbath day came. They were in a hurry. It says that he was crucified at the third hour. That's the third hour of daylight. That would be about 9 a.m. if you figure sunrise is at 6 a.m., They crucified him. They stuck him to the cross at 9 a.m. Darkness fell over the whole land at the sixth hour, which would be noon. And uh, so that would happen. And then he breathed his last in the ninth hour. That would be 3 p.m. The Sabbath would begin at sundown, approximately 6 p.m. They had three hours to get him off of the cross. Okay, you just couldn't have a dead body hanging there on the high and holy days of the Passover and the Sabbath. This was the last thing that the disciples, not the disciples, the, the, the high priest and the scribes who were so jealous of him, 
This was the last thing they could have, this was the worst case scenario. They did not want this, and yet God was providentially in control of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, not them. Don't get me wrong, they wanted him dead, but they wanted it in secrecy and darkness because that's how evil and sin works. It works in secrecy and darkness, and it's not, a fr- it's not bold enough to stand on its own two legs. And this was the last thing they wanted. They wanted it done at a different time. Um, it says in Mark chapter 14, verse 1, The Passover and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. Verse 2, for they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. This was a worst case scenario for the, the people that perpetrated here on earth. Through their sin and their willful act, this great evil and this act of injustice upon Christ, even though in God's providence and God's sovereignty, he was using their free will evil for his divine providential purposes in the crucifixion of his son. So there was a rush. He dies at 3 p.m. There's a rush to get him off of the cross, get the body off of the cross. The other gospel accounts tell us they went along and broke the legs of the other two criminals so they would hurry up and they couldn't hoist themselves up and breathe. When they break their legs, they just had to hang and they would asphyxiate. That's how you die in crucifixion. You basically drown. You, you, you lose the ability to breathe. They came to Christ. He was already dead. They speared him in the side and the water had already separated. His blood had already separated between the red blood cells and the white blood cells, confirming he was dead. They did not break his legs. That fulfills prophecy in the Psalms. It said, not a bone of his chosen one would be broken. So it's, it's 3 o'clock. What do we do? There's a panic. Well, we move on and we see in Mark chapter 15, verse 42, we see what happened. And all of his disciples and everybody that really cared about him were scattered. The women couldn't get him off the cross by themselves. What was going to happen? It says, when evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God, and he gathered up courage, it took courage to do this, and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, He questioned him as to whether he was already dead. In ascertaining from this centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph brought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been honed out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking to see where he was laid. We see uh, Joseph of Arimathea coming and taking Jesus down. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. 700 years before Christ walked on the earth, the book of Isaiah was written. By the way, the whole book of Isaiah is about Jesus. You may not have known that. In fact, all of the Old Testament is about the Christ. It's about Jesus. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9 tells us this. It says, His grave was assigned with wicked men, Yet he was with a rich man in his death. He died with true criminals, the true guilty party. He died with them, and it was a rich man who placed him in his own tomb. Joseph of Arimathea is a prominent member of the council, also known as the Sanhedrin. Luke 23, verse 51 tells us he was a wealthy man and a good man who had not at all agreed with the council decision against Jesus. John 19, verse 39 through 40, tells us that there was another council member, Nicodemus. He joined with him in moving Christ's body. It was Joseph's own family tomb. It was the tomb of a wealthy man, like a wealthy man today might buy uh, his own family cemetery or cemetery plot. That's what this was. As we look at Jesus, he's mortally wounded beyond recognition. He's dead. They take him down off of the cross in whatever clumsy fashion that must have looked like. 
We see these two men at great risk to their own reputation. They were a member of the council that demanded and and trumped up charges that Jesus must die. They were a member of that council, so this was not a popular move. They were definitely in the minority on this. We see these two men at great risk to their own reputation simply wrapping the body of Jesus and placing it in the grave. There was no time for anointing Jesus' body. I think Jesus probably knew that when he saw Mary, the sister of Martha, anointing him with a costly perfume. He says, she's done a good thing. She's anointing me for burial because there wasn't any time to do that when he was crucified. Jesus knew that. The Sabbath at this point was just an hour or so away, so they were in a little bit of a rush. So it is, we look at the death of Jesus Christ. We look at the death of Jesus Christ, and it is a vital part of the gospel, but not by itself. It is through the death on the cross that we are justified. That is where our sins were paid for. We believed upon the gospel, and here on earth in our life and the flesh, those who place their faith and total trust in the gospel and repent of their sins are born again. Who's one of the guys taking them off the cross? Nicodemus, remember a conversation that happened with Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Truly you must be born again. That's exactly what happens to the believer. Anyways, here on earth we believe we are born again. The fancy word is we are regenerated. And in heaven, the corresponding event in heaven before the throne of God is that we are justified. That is, that we have been given peace with God. Okay, we no longer owe the penalty. The fine's been paid. The time's been served. Christ took the full punishment and the curse upon himself on the cross. So the death of Christ is vitally important. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 tells us this. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus' death by itself is incomplete, In fact, his death is not our gospel hope. His death is the very curse that necessitates the need for the gospel. It is his death that does that. Death is Adam's work, not Christ's work. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 through 22. By the way, the whole thing's about the resurrection. I encourage you to go and read that for a theological viewpoint on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 says, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So it is not the death of Christ alone that brings about salvation. And, and what Jesus did on the cross was not merely the natural act of dying, even in a premeditated, violent act, there was more going on than that. That's what's happening from the the human perspective. It was a violent, premeditated act. It was a lie. It was an act of injustice. It was a gross abuse of justice, but there was something else going on in the heavenlies, in the divine. Okay? Back to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10 tells us this, but the Lord was pleased, the Lord God, Heavenly Father, was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Because of this, this is why we see the great trauma and stress in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see Jesus in a state of distress and and vulnerability like we've never seen him anywhere else in Scripture. He's never this vulnerable and distressed uh, before this, and he never is after. It, It just doesn't happen. And we read this in Mark chapter 14, just a page prior. uh, Mark 14, verse 34 through 36. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Talking to his three closest disciples. And he went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. We see Jesus having a moment in 
the flesh, a moment of knowing what the full torment of God could be like. Uh, somebody who had never experienced discipline, he's sinless, in sinless perfection, never been separated from God, and yet he's getting ready to bear the full wrath of God. I mean, you think about it, eternal damnation for every sinner. And then millions and millions of years of God's torment falling upon him. And he's sitting there saying, Abba, Daddy, if it's possible, take this away. Is there another way? In prayer, he knew the Father's will. He knew that the answer was no, there is no other way. And he committed to it. He committed to it. He says, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he's talking about the hour. The hour might pass him by. What hour is that? The ninth hour on Friday when he would cry out, my God, my God, daddy, daddy, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me alone? Why am I feeling nothing but your wrath and I feel none of your goodness and love at this point? That was the hour that he was praying might pass him by, but it did not come to pass. It, 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 or it did come to pass. It, he was not rescued from that hour. So we see that the cup that Jesus submitted to was the crushing of the Lord, his heavenly Father. It was God the Father putting God the Son to grief as a guilt offering for the sins of the whole world that would believe in the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So to say that Jesus simply died upon the cross is to oversimplify the gospel greatly. Okay, here's your first point. Jesus did not merely die on the cross. Those two criminals merely died on the cross. Jesus did not. He bore the full wrath of God for the sins of those who would believe. Yes, he died, but that was there's more to it. He was bearing the full wrath of God for the sins of those who would believe. Throughout Scripture, we see God pouring out His wrath on various nations and people, but those are simply temporal judgments. They weren't final and complete. There are only two final and complete ju judgments also presented in Scripture. The one that we see here that Jesus bore on the cross for the sins of those who were given to Him by God the Father through a repentant faith in Christ. And then in the book of Revelation, at the end of the time, we see in the book of Revelation the unfolding of this great distress to come upon the world at the hands of an angry God. We see the seven uh, seal judgments come upon the earth, and the seventh seal judgment is the seven trumpet judgments. And these judgments came upon the earth, and then the seventh trumpet, when the final trumpet sounds, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, when that final trumpet sounds... The seven bowls, or cups of wrath, being poured out on those who remain in their sins. God's judgment is perfect. Okay, you got to realize this. This is God's perfection. We do not understand this level or this degree of accuracy. We have no clue how perfect God's holiness and judgment, his wisdom, his discernment, his, his omniscience, that means he's all-knowing, his omnipresence, he's everywhere, he sees all, he knows our hearts, even though our mouths and our actions might betray what the true intentions of our hearts are, none of that deceives God. God's judgment is perfect, and every sin that the whole world, every man throughout the history of mankind has ever committed is perfectly punished either upon Jesus Christ on the cross or upon the person that wants to hold on to their sin and remain unrepentant, remain unforgiven. Okay, it doesn't seem like much of a choice, and yet the Bible tells us it's a wide path that leads to destruction. It's a narrow path that leads to righteousness and everlasting life. So if it's not just the death of Jesus, what else is it? What else is it? Well, let's read on. Let's go to Mark chapter 16, verse 1. Mark chapter 16, verse 1, it says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? 
Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. Verse 7, But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. They were afraid. So we see it's the same women who followed Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and the body of Christ to the tomb. They knew what tomb they laid him in, and so they returned as soon as possible after the Sabbath at first light. Okay? There were a few other women there that were mentioned by the other gospel writers, but these are the two that Mark emphasizes. Being that all of the men had scattered, just as Jesus had told them they would do in Mark chapter 14, verse 27, they were having a conversation with themselves as to how they were going to access the body, given the large stone that was rolled into place. Then they got there and realized that the stone had already been rolled away. But what did that mean? Well, Matthew, Matthew's gospel tells us how the stone was moved. Matthew 28, verse 2 says, And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and rolled the stone away and sat upon it. Interesting. Cautiously entering the tomb, they encounter some angels. Mark only mentions the angel that spoke. But needless to say, it frightened them. It frightened them. I mean, why not? Earthquakes are scary. Okay? And what are obviously angelic beings are pretty intimidating. I don't know where the idea of the cute little cherry chub, uh, cherub came from. Ch- ch- what am I trying to say? The cute little chubby cherub. I'll say that one five times fast. I don't know where the idea of the cute little chubby cherub came from, but it's not found in Scripture. The the angels of Scripture are the host of heaven. They're the army of heaven. They are fierce warriors. They're all fierce warriors. So pretty intimidating. The army of God, and you're presented with one of those soldiers of God, it's understandable that they were frightened. But we go back to the words that he said to them there in verse 6. He said to him, do not be amazed, or basically do not be frightened. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. It's always Peter. Tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Just as he told you. So the angel instructs the women to tell the disciples, particularly Peter, to go ahead to Galilee where they would see Jesus just as he told them. We see this. Where did he tell them? Well, right there at the end of the Lord's Supper in Mark chapter 14, verse 27 through 28. Uh, If you just take a turn your page over there. I had to turn two pages. Jesus said there, this is why they are all gone. He says, uh, verse 27, And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Now John tells us that the first person to see the risen Savior was Mary Magdalene. Our passage tells us the same thing, that uh, she was the first. Okay? Okay. So the timeline goes a little something like this. Mark gives us the Reader's Digest version. It's the shortest of the Gospels, and there's a reason why. The women go. They see the empty tomb. They're instructed by the angels. They go and tell a few of the disciples, particularly John and Peter. They run to see the empty tomb, and Mary Magdalene alone returns with them. 
John and Peter witnessed the empty tomb and are bewildered by it. They probably didn't know where it was. Mary had to show it to them. They were bewildered by it. John himself tells us that they, including himself, had not yet come to understand the Scripture and the plain teaching of Christ that he would be raised from the dead on the third day. So it says they simply, they saw it, they were bewildered, they simply returned to their lodging place, leaving Mary Magdalene alone. There alone she encounters the living Christ at first, mistaking him through her tears for the gardener. But she had the first encounter with the living Christ. That's what changes stuff. That's where things change. Look at verse 9. Now, it says, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, the Lord's day, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. They refused to believe it. After that, he appeared in different form to two of them while they were walking along on their way to the country. We talked about that, the two men on the road to Emmaus. We talked about that at sunrise service today. That's in Luke chapter 24. Okay. Um, and then let's see, verse 13. They went away and reported it to the others, but they did not believe them either. People weren't believing, even after he told them. Isn't that weird? Verse 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. And he reproached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. So you see, our hope is in more than just the death of Jesus Christ and our hope is in more than just the empty tomb. The empty tomb by itself left them frightened and left them bewildered and they were still in a state of disbelief. It wasn't the empty tomb alone. Was it grave robbers? That was the official position of the Jewish high court. You can see that in Matthew's gospel. We won't go there. Had some other disciple, because they all scattered, and what were they all doing? They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have cell phone and text messages and all of that stuff. Had some other disciple come and taken the body out of the, the, the borrowed tomb and put it in a more permanent grave that would befit somebody born and dying into poverty? Was that a possibility? Only Mary had seen the risen Christ, and they all thought she was having hysterical hallucinations. They thought she was losing it. They did not believe her because they did not understand what Jesus clearly taught them. So why did the disciples not understand what to us who today believe and read the Bible, see as clearly being taught by Jesus? I believe the answer lies in the illumination of the Holy Spirit. They, by the sovereignty of God, had to have their eyes open to what Christ had taught them. I don't just say that. I'm not making it up. It's in the Bible. John chapter 20, verse 8. Uh, this was the gospel account of Peter and John running to the tomb. It says the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. We go to Luke's gospel. Okay, After the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, we read this. Luke chapter 24, verse 44 through 46. Now he, Jesus, said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And look at this. Christ himself. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. We see early allusions to this early in Christ's ministry in John, same uh, John chapter 2, verse 19. This was the first time that Jesus cleansed the temple. 
got everybody's attention. John chapter 2, verse 19 through 20, Jesus answered them, saying, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And then look at the next line. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. The word which Jesus had spoken. So here's the deal. They really weren't with excuse. They they didn't have an excuse here because your next point is this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ had long been foretold by the prophets and even Christ himself. The resurrection of Jesus Christ had long been foretold by the prophets and Christ himself. So basically, when we see the state of disbelief after the report, at this point, you see, no one's mind had been supernaturally opened to the teaching of Christ and the empty tomb alone. Okay, the empty tome alone, it brings about fear, disbelief, and astonishment. So if it is not just the death of Christ, and if it's not just the empty tomb, then what is our hope? Well, it's real easy, and this didn't make it in the bulletin. I don't know why. This is my fault. Here's your bonus point. Here's your main point. Our hope is in a living God and Savior. It's in the resurrection. It is in the resurrection. It's in that encounter with the living God. Since you've got to write the whole thing out, I'll tell you. Our hope is in a living God and Savior. It's the resurrection. Just circle that because that's your main point. We see Jesus rebuking them for their unbelief and their misunderstanding. Now, Albeit the trauma of the cross had left them completely rattled. The empty tomb had left them bewildered. They lost their nerve. They nearly lost their faith, including the things they had clearly heard. And not only that, the things they had clearly seen, which is what? That Jesus had power over death. He had power over death. I could understand not seeing the implication of destroying the temple and rebuilding it in three days. I can understand that. But Jesus had also told them plainly in our uh, book that we're looking at, in Mark chapter 10, verse 33, on the road to Jerusalem. They were going to Jerusalem for the crucifixion. He says in Mark chapter 10, verse 33, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles, that is the Romans. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. So we see that Jesus told them plainly, but he also, he showed them plainly. It wasn't just that he told them he was going to rise again on the third day and that he had power over death. He showed them in Luke's gospel in chapter 7, don't go there. Uh, we see that Jesus raised the son of a widow outside uh, the town of Nain, okay? He raised her son. It was a funeral march that was going by, and he called him out of the dead. At the end of Mark chapter 5, we see Jesus raised the Talitha, or the, the little girl, the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue official. She was dead, and he raised her from the dead. And in John chapter 11, the whole teaching, the whole point of that passage was about the resurrection from the dead as exemplified through the raising of Lazarus, calling Lazarus out of the tomb. So we see that through a supernatural spiritual blindness and perhaps just the enormity of the stress of the crucifixion um, that the crucifixion put the disciples through, there was a period of disbelief. But then Christ appears to them. Then what happens to the disciples? Whole different ballgame. Whole different ballgame. Let's look at verse 15. Okay, back in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. So he appears to them. He he reproaches them for their unbelief, the hardness of the heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. And then he tells them, verse 15, 
And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So why would Christ give these scared, forgetful, bewildered disciples the instruction to go into all of the world and preach the gospel to all of creation? Had they not already proved that they did not understand the significance of what he taught them, showed them, and what he had just accomplished through the cross, the grave, and through the resurrection, why would he call them to this great task? Why has he called you and me to this great task? The task that God called them to is now referred to as the Great Commission. That's the title we've given it in modernity. It was given after the resurrection by a living Jesus. And the hiding, scared, and and doubting disciples were transformed by the hope and the power of the living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They were transformed into bold witnesses for the living Christ by His presence and by His power. By his presence and by his power. The Great Commission, more commonly read out of Matthew's Gospel, even though this is it right here. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe All that I commanded you, that's important. And look what he says there at the end. And lo, I am with you always. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We have the presence of the living Christ when we are doing gospel, God, kingdom, ministry work, great commission work. We go to Acts chapter 1-8, another part of the Great Commission, okay? This is right before the ascension of Christ. And he tells them what? He says this, but you will receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, okay, the city, and in Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Presence and power. I am with you always, and you will receive power. Presence and power of the resurrected living Christ, God the Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. That's why we are thousands of miles away from where all of this took place. As far as Acts 1-8 is concerned, we are the remotest part of the world. And here we are 2,000 years later celebrating the risen Christ. Why? Because of the power and the presence of God in the living Christ. No honest pastor, no honest preacher, no honest evangelist or missionary would claim that they could rise to the great task of which they have been called by their own strength and intellect. It takes the comforting, encouraging, motivating, and emboldening power of the living Lord to keep them going in their ministry. I'm no exception. Mark gives us a very brief summary of the books of Acts in the next four verses here. He kind of tells us this. Now realize these verses from about uh, nine down have been, uh, they're not in the earliest manuscripts, but they were given just as a summary, I think, of Acts. I think as the letters being distributed, that's one of the things that qualified it to be in the Bible was how widely distributed and accepted it was. You know, maybe they didn't have full manuscripts to send everybody Acts, so they tacked this on to the end. They tacked this on to the end. I don't think it's any less scripture because it just tells us what happens in the book of Acts. But he gives us that in the next four verses. uh, We look there. Oops, I I missed the point. Here we go. Your point there. We need resurrection reassurance. 
We need resurrection reassurance to carry out the great kingdom work he called the church to do. We need resurrection reassurance to carry out the great kingdom work he has called the church to do. And the great kingdom work is the great commission. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I have commanded you. The church in the modern last century has made a false division between evangelism and discipleship. Discipleship, go and make disciples. Teach them everything. Discipleship is the Great Commission. It is evangelism. So one of the reasons we're pushing for deeper, more teaching here, more understanding, more scripture. Okay? So Mark gives us this very brief summary in the book of Acts of what it looked like when the church went from hiding and scared and bewildered and unbelieving to being bold witnesses and accomplishing this great kingdom work. That's what the whole book of Acts is about. So we look in Mark chapter 16, verse 17 through 20. This just runs us to the end. It says, these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That's the book of Acts, okay? Uh, All of those things, we're not sure about the deadly poison, but who knows, people really hated the Apostle Paul. They might have poisoned him, and he didn't know it. It wasn't recorded, and he didn't die. He was bit by a snake, he shook it off, and he didn't die, okay? Verse 19, so when the Lord Jesus, the living Lord Jesus, had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, the ascension, and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them. And confirmed the word by the signs that followed. And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. How huge. How important. Everything we read in these verses or what we read had happened supernaturally through the first century church and the apostles as they moved the gospel to the the ends of the known world at that time and even beyond that. We see that in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. All of the sign gifts that are really only seen in Acts, these sign gifts of, uh, of men having the power over demons and speaking in tongues and and healing people on their command and all of those things, we see it happening uh, throughout the book of Acts, whenever the gospel was taken uh, with power into that next concentric ring. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we see it in Jerusalem. And then we see it in the broader context of Judea. Then we see it in the broader context of Samaria. And we see it to the ends of the earth. So think about it. We're talking Overgard, Navajo County, Arizona, the rest of the world. Okay, And every time it moved into one of those new regions, as commanded by Christ, we see these powerful sign gifts. All were done through the power of Christ, not the individual. Okay, They were done according to the will of Christ, not the individual. We see this a number of times with the Apostle Paul. Sometimes he heals people, sometimes he can't. Okay, It's not his gift, it's not his power. It's the power of Christ according to the will of Christ. So we see this, and and what do we see as the true sign and the true seal of the Holy Spirit? The true sign and the true seal of the Holy Spirit is one who is brought into faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus' own clearest, explicit teachings of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16 says, the Spirit... The Spirit will proclaim the excellencies of me. He will will proclaim my glory, the glory of Christ. 
So the Holy Spirit proclaims the goodness of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And you find somebody that's really busy talking about the Holy Spirit, you got to wonder if they have it because somebody that's really filled with the Holy Spirit talks about Jesus, Jesus Christ, His death, His resurrection, His life, His power, His gospel. It's about Jesus. you got to know that. I get really tired of false prophets and false preachers running around blaspheming the name of the Holy Spirit, condemning themselves to hell, claiming they have powers as they bilk widows and orphans and anybody they can get money from in the name of God, the Holy Spirit. Oh, how hot the flames of hell will be. God, the Holy Spirit, glorifies Jesus Christ, not himself. So when you see a person going from being dead in their sins, indifferent of Jesus, ignorant of and bored with scriptures, to all of a sudden go into the complete opposite, to becoming aware and at war with their own sin, okay, in love with Jesus to the point of being a strong, vocal believer and a bold witness for Christ, to having a great hunger for the Word of God and being given an ever-increasing understanding of the Scriptures, then you know you have a true work of God the Holy Spirit through the calling of God the Father, through the finished work of Jesus, God the Son, for the glory of the Holy Trinity. That's the Gospel. That's the Gospel. The true power of the Holy Spirit is a changed life that can change a leper's spots, that can make a sinner just totally satisfied and comfy and pleased in his sin, at war with that sin, pursuing righteousness with all abandonment, the fullness of the counsel of God, proclaiming Jesus, lifting up others, exalting Jesus Christ, Equipping their brothers and sisters in Christ. Engaging the lost world with the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Helping people to encounter the living Christ. Church, are you there? That's the question. Are you there? So important for us to get the grip of the gospel. All of this is in response to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. He fulfilled all of the law. He didn't negate the law. He didn't abolish the law. He didn't make it go away. He fulfilled it. He kept the law. Nobody else even came close. Even when they thought they had, they hadn't. He did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law perfectly, sinless, blameless, spotless, Lamb of God, Good Shepherd, all of the above. And then there's his atoning, redeeming, suffering, bleeding, purchasing, death and work upon the cross. And then today, we celebrate his glorious resurrection. We know that he is alive. We know that he is alive. And so through the resurrection of Christ, the living Lord, and the work that we still see him doing today in the lives of sinners who would just as in their own nature, without the providential intervening of God, would be like a dog to their own vomit, back to their own sins, back to their own disbelief, back to their own bewilderment, back to their own lostness, back to their own stupidity, back to their own rebellion and hatred for God. When any of us get saved, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And it is a work of Jesus Christ. Final point. The resurrection proves the excellencies of Him that we proclaim. The resurrection proclaims and proves the excellencies of Him that we proclaim. Oh, boy. If you have never 
been compelled to respond to the gospel with full faith and repentance? Could it be that God has you here by divine appointment to do so? Could it be that you are here to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ through the gifts that he's given you? The ability to have faith in him because you don't have it on your own and the ability to have power over your sin because any of us honestly speaking in the mirror knows we do not have the power over our sin on our own. Could it be that God is calling you? If so, I want you to take time to speak with me afterwards or make an appointment with the office this week. It's all on the back of the, uh, the bulletin. I think I'm going to take tomorrow off. Um, but call me on Tuesday. Make an appointment on Tuesday. I would love to talk to you about this. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we love you and we praise you. Oh my goodness, Lord. The, the, the gospel, Jesus' great suffering, his shame, bearing our shame on the cross, this great injustice, Lord God. Oh my goodness, it's, it's too much to bear. And then the glorious resurrection of the living Christ. What a better example. There can't be any better example of Romans 8, 28, that, that you and your awesome power and providence and sovereignty can cause all things, even wicked, horrible things, to work out for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Lord God, we praise you. We praise you so much for Jesus Christ. We praise you for the gift of your son, Lord God. We lift him high. We exalt him, Lord God. We need to proclaim with boldness his goodness unto all the nations. This world is in a total and utter mess. Our officials, public, whatever, those in power, those with a microphone, they, they push smut and rebellion against you and silence the truth. What a wicked world we live in, Lord God. We need you. We need the living Christ. We need the living Christ so desperately. Lord God, I would pray, Lord God, that right here you would begin a good work in this community. And, and even to the ends of the earth, from right here, maybe just through missions, offerings at first, but Lord God, may it be that some or many are called to go and proclaim your excellencies to the nations from right here at First Southern Overguard. Lord God, if there's anybody here today who's never truly responded to the gospel of Jesus' finished work, he kept the law, he took the punishment, he rose from the dead. If Somebody is here today that has not responded in faith and repentance. So, uh, perhaps they're looking at, at their own works of righteousness, their own religiosity, Lord God. Take that away from them. Give them the hope and the peace and the comfort with you that comes only through the finished work of Jesus Christ and his glorious gospel. Lord God, we love you and we praise you. And we sing high your praises. Lord God, we ask all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Please stand to your feet and let's worship our Lord and Savior.